I finally it's like a dream come true. I, I, I now I join the Brazilian activities, but I'm still stuck in the northern hemisphere. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, now uh, today the first talk is going to be by uh, Professor Santos uh, from UFPE. He's going to talk about dynamics of isosceles problem generated by collinear solution. Uh, uh, time is yours. No, I'm here. Yeah, so, that's that's the that's the professor who came. Hello. Hi. <laughs> nice to meet you. <laughs> so nice to meet you. So are you ready to uh maybe you can share your screen or you can okay. <laughs> Please, everybody, if you can uh, turn off your cameras because the, the connection is better when we turn off the cameras. Thank you. Okay. Ever, everyone listen to me. Yes. Yes? Yes. yes. So, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Karine, and the professor Ildeberto was my advisor in doctorate. And he is an enthusiastic person, and to me, for me, it's a pleasure to work with him and to talk in this event. So I'd like to thank for this invitation. Uh, I will talk about the, the problem of my thesis, that is dynamics of an isosceles problem generated by a collinear solution. This is a layout of my presentation. So we obtain the Hamiltonian equilibrium, the new, uh, so we reduce it, the Hamiltonian, and we obtain the normal form we study the stability and the parametric stability and we talk about the resonance and we constructed the boundary curves of the stability and instability regions. So the isosceles problem is a particular case of two-body problem and their solutions can be classified in, into three types. In the first type, we have all the mass in the same plane, and these two masses are symmetrical in relation of this axis. In the second type, we have that this, these masses are symmetrical in relation of this plane, in both cases, we have collisions here. So the angular moment, it's new, it's zero. And the third type of the solution, we have these masses are symmetrical in relation of this, this axis. And here we don't have collisions. So the angular moment is not zero we work in this case, okay? Uh, we started with a collinear solution and we perturbed the extremal masses and we denote for this perturbation the overline V and overline double. So we, we do this and in this with these masses and because of the symmetry, we we just will look for we look at this this movement of these masses, and here when we up these masses for the center of the masses to remain in the origin, the third mass comes down to here. Uh, here we have the radio of the 
the ellipses and your eccentricity. So here we have this, this elliptical movement. Uh, because the, the isosceles problem is a particular case of true-body problem, we can use the, the movement equation of true-body problem and we can write the, the equation of the dynamics of this problem in this form. So because this equation is a second order equation, we can, we can uh, guarantee the existence of the isosceles so solution given, given the initial condition, we can guarantee the isosceles solution. And here, when when the vector perturbation uh, are new, we come back to the collinear solution. We can observe this, look at here. Né? So, for to study the dynamics of this, this problem, we need to obtain your equation and we can we can observe the, the movement of the mass M1 because the, the symmetry of the problem. Uh, your position is given by in this form where this theorem realizing the, this movement, elliptical movement. And we need to look for this, this part of this, this position. So, because the overline V, it's on the plane, we, we can denote in this form, and we do the raised scale of the orthogonal vector. So we can write the, this equation in this form. Okay. And again, we, we do the adjust the equation normalizing the units. So we put mu equal to the raison of the masses and we consider L such as this happen. So we can uh, rewrite the equation in this form. And now uh, Z represent the, the, the variables of the perturbation. So we we do that this these variables movement as uh, with this part of the equation so we realize the rotation and we consider the homotative movement because the radio of the ellipses and using the fact of Kepler's theory, we can obtain the Hamiltonian in in pulsating coordinates. So we 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 have this Hamiltonian. And it is this this term? And now we can we can talk about equilibrium. So we obtain for this this problem we obtain this equilibrium in this form where the f two first and, and three years here are in the unitar cycle in this form. And here, when we, we go to present two results that happen in our problem, and the first uh, result, the proposition one, with if I have a uh, equilibrium point of the system and the psi is a first integral such that this condition is satisfies, so the this matrix of the linear part of this Hamiltonian have a new angle. So in, in our case, we can observe that this term of the, the Hamiltonian here this term is a first integral of my of our problem and satisfy this condition. So because this result, we have that um, 
the our metrics have a new eigenvalue. In the fact, when when we calculate the characteristic polynomial of this matrix, we have this polynomial. We have this polynomial, and we can see that the first term we have the new eigenvalue, and because this this another terms we have two pairs of pure imaginary eigenvalues when the mu are not zero. The second result, uh, sorry, here, um, because the new eigenvalue, eigenvalue and because this matrix uh, is not diagonalizable, we can apply this result for contornate the situation. So we have uh, one uh, autonomous Hamiltonian system and psi is a first integral that does not depend on time. So in some region of this condition is satisfied, we can low on unit the number of degree freedom of the system. So in our, ca our case, again, we have this that this term is a first integral that does not depend on the time. So, because this result, we can reduce it, the Hamiltonian system. So, we pass, we have three degree freedom, and now we have two degree freedom. And here appear this gamma. And when gamma is equal to one, we have that the system have this equilibrium and the linearized Hamiltonian on equilibrium solution is given by in this form and now uh, for to simplify the study of this problem we we obtain the normal form of this this Hamiltonian so your normal form of the linearized Hamiltonian is in this form. And here we have the frequencies in this form. And the Dirichlet theorem uh, says that this, when when eccentricity is it's zero, we have that the system is stable. Okay. And but let's go to to talk about uh, this stability and uh, let's go a little deeper into the question of the stability here we have the a linear and continuous system and this is a normal uh, no stability definition and suppose that we have we also have that the system is periodic and and we get this norm in the space so we say that this system is strongly stable if it's stable and every neighbor linear system uh, is also stable and uh, here we can we can see that this the strong stability it, it's it's very complicated to happen in the practice. So maybe we can we can talk about some some concept that it's intermediate to the the two st stability. So we can define the parametric stability. Uh, usually our problems depends of the some para some parameters so suppose that that now we have uh, a linear and continuous system and that depend of the these parameters we say that this this system is parametrically stable if it's stable for some some parameters here if it's stable and every neighbor linear system coming from 
this parameter uh, is stable. Uh, that is, there is uh, one radio of this ball that's centering in this parameter that for any parameters in the ball, uh, this system is stable. So with this definition, we can see that with the system is strongly stable, so it's parametrically stable. Okay, but in our case, uh, we have the two pi periodic reduced Hamiltonian system, linear linearized on equilibrium solution. And this system depends of the raison of the masses here represents me and depends of the eccentricity here represented for epsilon. We saw that for eccentricity nu, we have that the system, the Hamiltonian, reduced Hamiltonian is stable. But uh, what happened with the system, what happened with the system when the eccentricity is it's not zero? We can see that with the system is a strongly stable for some parameters. So, and then this, this, uh, the system is parametrically stable. Thus, the system is stable for all parameters on neighborhood of this, these parameters. But what happened uh, with the system is not strongly stable. So, uh, this, uh, there is some neighboring linear system of the system that is not stable. And, but, it, but this does not mean that the Hamiltonian of parametric family are unstable. And uh, I want to say that maybe exist some parametric values that we have this system stable and maybe exist some parameters, values that this system is unstable. But for what parametric values this happen? Now we using Floquet Okay, theory, multiple multipliers, crying Galfelitz theorem, and the prior methods, we can determine curves when we have two parameters that that is our case, or you can obtain surface when you have more than two parameters that describe the stability in the stable regions. Uh, in a, E, and here, uh, in this theory, we need to to look for multiple multiple multipliers, crying resonance, and have the relation of crying of leads theorem. And I don't don't we talk about this. And now we will obtain the the resonance of the system. So remember that the reduced Hamiltonian system, linearized on equilibrium solution, is given by in this form, where the frequencies is given by in this form. And look at that here, we always, always we have integer, integer number, so here, it's here. So the resonance depends of the second frequency. When this frequency to 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 omega, omega three uh, not integer some values of the mu, the mu we have a simple resonance, and we have double resonance when this happen. 
in our case, we obtain three values of parametric personas. Um, and uh, I will show one case that we construct the boundary curves. And in our case, the combinate resonance that, uh, that uh, happen when this condition is satisfied, in our case, these do not happen. So I'm just talking about the double resonance in one case that we, we work it. Uh, so we constructed the boundary curves for the resonance in this case, okay, uh, and the value of uh, parametric resonance is three. So the curve uh, are in the plane, move uh, uh, axle, and can be expressed in this form where the coefficients here it's uh, obtained about uh, with the de prior method so uh, in our ca our case we obtain these two curves so here we have instability regions and stability regions look that uh, for ex, uh, low eccentricity, we can we have just this this piece of the, the curve that it's stable and here is stable and when the eccentricity uh, increase we 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 have the instability region. So this this example show us for that the strongly stable stability uh, it's very difficult to to happen but we can we can study the stability parametric and we can obtain some uh, a little more info information about the system and here we have the some some bibliography that I use it. Uh, this this bibliography of the professor and and Lucia, the preliminary ver version that uh, that your book and Markev for the the construct the the, the boundary curves. Um, Zigo that uh, that have the reducing reduced result that we using here, and that that's it. I'm finished. Any question? Oi. Sorry, I don't listen. I mean, uh, any question? Okay. No questions. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
It means that your present presentation is too clear. They will not trust the best. Sorry, can you repeat uh, slowly? <laughs> ah. I mean, your presentation is too clear, leaving no uh, ambiguity, leaving no, no, uh, nothing to ask. Oh, very nice. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, well, in my case, I, that's the second time I see it. So, first time. If I had any questions, no, she answered them. <laughs> yeah. I was in her thesis defense. That was his, her thesis. She just defended. So, congratulations, Karin. That was excellent. Uh, I think you, you know, I'm glad that you, and in particular that you, you did it in English. Uh, Thank I think you. that was great. <laughs> so, Keep up with the good work. Né? Continue, continue aí com um bom trabalho, né? É, preparando aí, né? A publicação, né? Da tese. Isso. E, é, e os futuros projetos. É... E agradecer aos seus colegas também que lhe ajudaram aí, né? Com alguns, né? Isso. Diagramas e cálculos e, né? Parte computacional. Uhum. Yeah. Very, very Carlos, o Gerson, a Lúcia, yeah, a gente some também. Friends, uh, some people that have been right working in celestial mechanics too and collaborated with her. So it's good that she, you know, she remembered the names and mentioned them. Mr. Kurchek, I, I guess that's it, no? <laughs> uh, yeah, okay. All right, uh, thanks, the speaker again. Uh, I, I think uh, it's time for uh, for uh, for the uh, happy birthday video. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Happy I birthday will... video for Professor Peter Berdo. So, yeah, yeah, I'm going to present. Uh, okay, so now I'll leave it to you for the for the video. Hi, I am Marcelo. I came to receive in 2008 to study mathematics and I uh, was studying with this book by Elon Lages and then some friends of mine handed to me uh, some notes on multidimensional multi analysis written by a guy named Udalberto and I found this note very great but I didn't know the guy and then some time after that he gave he started to give uh, lectures uh, at the department and uh, I, I was passing to the corridor and he, he was always smiling and uh, with such a, a joy and happy because he was giving lectures and I <laughs> I was thinking, oh my god, he, he, this guy really loves what he is doing because you can see he's, uh, uh, he's really happy with this. And uh, uh, I chose to study mechanics and uh, Udoberto was on my examination board on the master degree and also on the doctorate doctorate degree and uh, I, I know him for many years now but uh, he, he never stopped to surprise us I think uh, some years ago I discovered that he was like translating uh, translating a book from Russian in <laughs> I I still thinking, oh my god, this is really possible, this guy also knows Russian and uh, he has been such a uh, inspiration to us, 
he inspired many people from my generation and like uh, myself and Ti Thiago and Annette and uh, many people that uh, are uh, from other generations and uh, one day I had the opportunity to to have a to speak with Alberto and ask about his uh, experiences on mathematics and I discovered that uh, uh, many things like the, this guy actually was his uh, advisor on the master degree and uh, another uh, guy that uh, I consider a mathematical hero uh, do Carmo that uh, give the advice to Roberto to choose uh, mathematics and uh, I think it was a, a great uh, advice and uh, also I, I like to think of Roberto because he is uh, very generous with our group on the UFRP we have a small group on celestial mechanics and uh, Udoberto always encourages us to, to participate on, the, uh, on many things and he always introduces uh, many people to us and he has been uh, of great help to us and uh, he is uh, uh, a guy that uh, we inspired, we were inspired by him, and uh, I, I, I uh, want to 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 express that, and also uh, I hope you have uh, many time to share your knowledge with us. And uh, happy birthday to you. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you for the video. <laughs> <laughs> So, Professor Hidopedo, want to say something about the video? Obrigado pelas lembranças e pela, pelas palavras. Thank you, Marcelo, for your words. Obrigado também, Douglas. Thank you. Okay. Ah. We are... Um, we are a little bit over time, so maybe we move on to the talk. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, the second talk is given by Professor Christian McCord from Northern Illinois University. Uh, I'm not sure if our Professor um, McCord remember me. I I was in uh, in your home, I think, maybe 18 years ago. Like 18 or 20 years ago, this was a Midwest meeting. Mm -hmm. Party at your home. I think that's I remember. Was. Yeah, I remember that. I I remember your home. It's very beautiful. Uh, so uh, today you are going to talk about topology and bifurcation of integral manifolds and body carbon. Now it's time. The uh, time is yours. Thank you. So, uh, like many of you, I'd like to begin with uh, uh, good wishes and uh, to Hildeberto and thanks for his hospitality. But unlike most of you, I really need to begin not just with thanks and good wishes, but with an apology. Uh, Hildeberto was kind enough to invite me to receive fee in 2000 to spend two weeks there. Uh, it was a very productive visit. Um, I used the opportunity to 
uh, begin the next stage of work on a project that Ken Meyer had brought me into in 1993. Um, and um, I had made some, some reasonable progress while I was visiting with Hildeberto. Uh, a critical part of the work uh, was accomplished, and I'll speak a little bit about that later. And I also uh, gave a set of lectures, which I had promised I would turn into uh, notes for his forthcoming book. Well, that's where the apology comes in. Um, I became engaged in administration. I took on the role of directing a, both directing a humanities center and uh, chairing a department. Uh, then I became an associate dean. Uh, then I became a dean. Uh, I spent two years as an acting provost of my university. And that whole time, that uh, that work I had begun with Hildeberto sat in a folder on my desk. You can see it there. And I would point to that folder and tell people, any day now, I'm going to get back to this paper. Any day now, I'm going to finish it. Well, I didn't finish it in time for Hildeberto's book, but I did finish it uh, just 20 years later. Uh, and uh, I apologize, Hildeberto, for being just a little bit late in getting the manuscript in. Uh, I understand the book went ahead just fine without me, and I congratulate you for it. Uh, and um, hope you won't mind that uh, I am belatedly acknowledging your generous hospitality and the good work we did together that led to these results. So integral manifolds of the n-body problem. This is a well-known classical problem. The integral manifolds are uh, obtained by taking uh, the traditional uh, n-body problem in three dimensions, the spatial problem. That'll be the focus. Um, the integral manifolds are the well-known level sets of the classical concept. Uh, conserve quantities, uh, center of setting center of mass and center of momentum to zero, fixing angular momentum uh, without loss, I'll always oriented along the z axis, fixing energy. Um, the integral manifolds, the level sets of, of these conserved quantities, um, admit a symmetry. Um, if angular momentum is zero, there is a full SO3 symmetry. Um, if angular momentum is fixed along the z-axis, then there's a rotational symmetry about the z-axis. Um, if we form the quotient manifolds where we divide by whatever is the appropriate symmetry group, we get what's known as the reduced integral manifold. So this appears at first blush to be a two-parameter family. Uh, but it turns out it's only really a one parameter family. It's the quantity energy momentum squared that is the only parameter that really uh, defines the manifolds. So in very broad terms, what I've been interested in has been a topological study of the integral manifolds. So that means three things to me. In some sense, I want to describe the integral manifolds. Well, what do we mean by that? It's great sometimes if we can describe it in the sense of the manifold is a product of a sphere and three tori. Or the manifold is this set minus that set. But it's rare, it's really rare to be able to give that sort of description. So for high dimensional manifolds, and in general, the, uh, the spatial, uh, integral manifold is a manifold of dimension 6n minus 10. To describe a high dimensional manifold, we need some, some tool to simplify the description to bring it to within manageable bounds. Uh, throughout my work, I focused on the homology groups as the tool for describing the manifold. So to me, describing the integral manifolds means computing their homology groups. And I won't take time to dive into the history, but you could argue that um, in some sense, that's why, that's what Poincaré invented homology to do. So I think there's something very, uh, very apt about the use of homology uh, 
which grew out of Poincaré's work on the n body on the three body problem, uh, to use that as the tool for describing it. Well, one of the things we're particularly interested in, I'm particularly interested in, is as we vary that one parameter, whether we think of varying new or or often I'll just think of varying energy for fixed angular momentum. As we vary the energy, we want to know when does the manifold structure change. Well, of course, one way to one way to detect that is to detect changes in the homology of the manifold. If the homology groups change, the manifold must have changed. So these two these two concepts will be linked for me. And the purpose of describing finding the bifurcations then really is hopefully we can use that information to detect the presence or absence of some interesting dynamical structure. Historically, the best opportunity has been to detect the absence by means of some sort of homological test. If a global cross-section exists, the homology has to show a certain pattern. So if the homology doesn't show that pattern, the global cross-section cannot exist. Theorems of that sort. So this, of course, is a problem with a long, long history. And I, I um, uh, don't want to go through uh, that history in detail. Uh, let me simply note a few highlights. Uh, Hildeberto's uh, thesis uh, studied the spatial problem with zero angular momentum, uh, studied the problem with non-zero angular momentum and positive energy, and essentially took care of those cases uh, in large measure. Uh, the planar problem had always proved more tractable and uh, was would, had been much more thoroughly described. There was considerable work done on attempts to understand the spatial problem, but um, the really key result is in Alain Aboui's 1993 work uh, in which he found a really elegant characterization of the necessary conditions for bifurcations of the spatial manifolds with negative energy. Uh, about the same time, Ken uh, brought Don Wang and I together, and we analyzed the spatial three-body problem, a uh, complementary to Alan's work. Alan had found the necessary conditions for bifurcations. We were able to compute the homology groups in the intervals between those values, show that at each, at each region had distinct homology. Therefore, if the homology changed, the manifold must have bifurcated. And therefore, all of the places that Alan had showed were the necessary conditions for bifurcation were in fact sufficient. So um, for non-zero, for zero angular momentum, basically there's positive and negative energy. For, uh, for non-zero angular momentum, there are positive energy, there's nothing interesting. For positive energy, non-zero angular momentum, the spatial manifold looks the same for all energy levels. Uh, the planar manifolds look the same for all energy levels. And for the planar problem, the bifurcations for negative energy can only occur at the relative equilibria. That is where there's a specific energy level associated with the re relative equilibria that uh, determines the, um, uh, the bifurcation levels that are possible. Um, if you know that, uh, you can use that to uh, find a homology formula a formula for the homology groups of the integral manifolds in terms of the level sets of the potential function on the mass ellipsoid. So that's the planar problem is essentially under control up to knowing all the central configurations, which of course is one of the great open problems in the n body problem. Uh, the spatial problem, though, presents several interesting features, uh, which really Alan's 1993 work brings into sharp focus. Um, there are finite singular values, finite, uh, that is finite in the sense of associated with a critical point of the energy function on the, the uh, angular momentum manifold. These are associated with relative equilibria. Um, and uh, in particular, you might, have, you might have thought that since the relative equilibria associated with the planar central configurations determine the bifurcations of the planar manifold, you might have thought that the spatial 
central configurations play a role in the bifurcations of the spatial manifold. They do not. It's only the planar central configurations and the associated relative equilibria that determine the, bifurcate, the finite bifurcation points. Why do I keep saying finite? Well, because there are the manifolds are non-compact. And because the manifolds are non-compact, uh, it is possible to have values that um, uh, bifurcations at infinity, bifurcations where you go off the uh, go away from any bounded region of the manifold. And again, Alain Abouy gave a really elegant description of these, which I will only try to roughly describe here. Um, imagine taking your end masses and dividing them up into clusters um, with some number of particles in each cluster. Take each of those particles and form a relative equilibria at some height z sub k, a different, different central configuration for each height, and then push them off in the z. So these are central configurations that each lie in its own yz plane. And then push them apart from each other, form a sequence of these which push apart from each other in the z direction while maintaining their structure in the xy directions. You'll get a limiting energy value. And that limiting energy value is a potential bifurcation value known as a, a, a bifurcation at infinity. So you get all possible subclusters of masses and all possible central configurations associated with those sub subclusters generates all possible singular values. That's still a finite set. And again, knowing all of those bifurcation values requires knowing all of the central configurations of your end masses and all subclusters. So with that framework, I want to try, again, my goals are to describe the integral manifolds, compute their homology, and where possible, draw some dynamical conclusions from it. So how do we go about that? So the idea is to take the integral manifold, project out momentum first, just project the uh, uh, project out momentum, and then scale the, the uh, um, position vector uh, to the, what we call the mass ellipsoid. So that's the set, this set S. Not every configuration is possible when you project. Some are allowed, some are forbidden. You can see what's allowed and forbidden by thinking about the fiber over such a point, back up in momentum space. If you, and I won't go through all of the uh, analysis, but it turns out two fairly simple looking, almost innocent looking um, things come into play. If you take a fixed position, there is a sphere of whose radius is determined by your energy level H and the potential value of the position that defines a sphere in momentum space. There's a plane or a, uh, an affine space to be proper in momentum space defined by the angular momentum constraint. That affine space and that sphere have to intersect for there to be, uh, for that position to be an allowable position. And you can, I, I think you can see fairly easy as you vary H or you vary the potential or you vary the, uh, the angular momentum constraint, the sphere and the plane move up against each other. And if the, the diameter, sorry, if the radius of this sphere shrinks too small, you can't have any momentum vectors uh, over that. That position becomes no longer allowable. As the uh, uh, affine space pushes out to infinity, it becomes harder and harder to have that intersection. And so one of the very valuable things you want to measure is the distance from that affine space to the origin so that you can compare the, the distance of the affine space to the radius of the sphere. We'll call the distance squared of, to the affine space, we'll, we'll, make, we'll make that a function y. It's an, you can write it down as an explicit function of the position. 
It's a god awful looking expression, but you can write it down. Um, and if you have the function y and you have the function u and you have the energy level h, you can combine them all and say the allowable configurations turn out to be the set of configurations that satisfy a seemingly straightforward expression. U squared over Y has to be greater than or equal to minus two H. So at one level, we've got a fairly elegant statement. Project onto allowable configurations, study the behavior of this function in order to find what the allowable configurations are. The fiber is going to be the intersection of this plane and the sphere is just going to be a sphere of one dimension lower. Well, what could be, what could be simpler? Well, there's some limitations. Uh, first of all, uh, a function that depends on the potential is at least as complicated as the potential function. And, you know, many of you have spent much of your careers wrestling with the complexities of the potential function. Uh, the, uh, it's the, the structure of the fiber changes as the momentum, as either the, the affine space pushes out or the sphere contracts, you get to a point where the two, the sphere and the, and the affine space are tangent to each other and the fiber reduces from a, a sphere of one dimension lower down to a point. So this is a singular fiber bundle. Uh, worse, uh, the potential function u, of course, is undefined at collision. Uh, so we have to delete the, co the collision set from our, our uh, space. And you can see it, right? It's the points in R3n, the tr traditional center of mass and uh, moment of inertia constraints. Uh, but you have to take away the collisions. So your space is non-compact. And if, that all, if all of that weren't uh, enough complexity, everything goes to hell at the collinear configurations. If you have a collinear configuration in the xy plane, like remember angular momentum is oriented along the z-axis. Uh, collinear configurations in the xy plane are allowable configurations, but collinear configurations outside of the xy plane schematically represented here are forbidden. So in your mass ellipsoid, you have to delete this dotted line, or it's actually a manifold of submanifold of dimension n, which then you have to put back in the collinear points in the um, the collinear points in the invariant plane. So now, now you have an allowable space where you have deleted a closed set initially, but then you've put back in a closed subset of that closed set. So you have a set of allowable configurations, which is neither open nor closed. Uh, worse, the fiber, the dimension of this hyperplane jumps a dimension at the allowable collinear configurations. It is, the dimension is one higher at that point than at all these other allowable points around it. And not only that, the uh, function y that measures the distance to that uh, 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 plane uh, is discontinuous along these excluded points. Essentially, these push out that plane pushes out to infinity. Y, if you will, is infinite here. It's equal to one in the invariant plane, and so as you approach those collinear points, you experience a discontinuity. So you've got a discontinuous fiber, you've got non-compactness, and you've got a discontinuous function. So what do we do? Well, when I visited Hildeberto in 2000, we looked at a simpler problem. We looked at the spatial manifolds with positive energy, where you have some of the discontinuities, but not all of them. And we found that you could uh, resolve the discontinuity in the dimension of the fiber by introducing a blow-up construction. So take that each of those collinear points, and if you look at the 2n minus 4 manifold normal to the uh, uh, collinear, configura collinear configurations in the invariant plane, you can blow up 
that collinear point and replace it with a sphere. The excluded collinear points are still excluded, so you have to delete the poles of that sphere. So you're basically inserting, taking out that point and inserting a twice punctured sphere in its place. Awkward as that seems, it works. Um, Hildeberto and I showed that you could use this to construct global coordinates for the positive energy manifolds. Uh, it in turn allowed us to compute the homology groups of the integral manifolds with positive energy. Uh, in the work I did after uh, my visit with Hildeberto, I was able to show that we could use the same, the same construction to manage all of the uh, complexities around collinear configurations for negative energy. So if you think of this uh, manifold, this blow up construction, um, again, the, the function y was discontinuous from different directions of approach. It turns out that adding this in is just what you need to, to uh, uh, obtain finite, uh, well-defined limits from every direction of approach. It also turns out that you have, by blowing up the, the uh, a configuration, uh, the discontinuity in the uh, fiber of the, manif of the momentum manifold over the point goes away, and you get a nice continuous uh, uh, sphere bundle. Uh, you still have a singular sphere bundle in that when the function d uh, goes to exactly the, the, the uh, bounding energy, the sphere still collapses to a point, but the discontinuity in the fiber is eliminated and you have otherwise, so you have, if you will, a continuous singular sphere bundle over a manifold defined by a continuous function. So you can take this blow up construction of the uh, base space, you've got the integral manifold, the original integral manifold, and you can, there's a pullback construction where you pull that blow up over the base back up to the momentum fiber. This becomes a nice sphere bundle. This becomes a relative homeomorphism where you're basically collapsing the, the points over the uh, collinear configurations. You've blown up, you've either think of them as being blown up when you pull back or collapsing when you push down. If you work, you can relate the structure of M, the or manifold you're interested in, you can relate to this new pullback space N, which you can then in turn relate to this because it's a nice singular sphere bundle over this set B, you can relate it to B. So I can relate the structure of the integral manifold to the structure of the blow up space. I can use that then to write down a um, closed form, if you will, uh, formula for the homology of the integral manifold. Not quite in terms of this set B, but in terms of set, the set B, uh, and its related spaces. And um, uh, I've been able to do that in a, an explicit, couple explicit settings that I'll show you. And in principle, I now have all the tools I need to study the, uh, uh, the four body problem uh, for equal masses. So it's not quite just this set. The set B again is this function D defined by, uh, you look at the, the level sets, the super level set where it's greater than or equal to minus two with twice the energy. So if you will, which what this schematic is meant to, but oh, sorry, I got ahead of myself. Of course, you have the boundary where that uh, a function is precisely equal to minus two H. You have this blow up set that you introduced around a collinear configuration and at some point, some of that blow-up set begins to become excluded. So the, you take the intersection of the blow-up set that's allowable, um, and then you can take the totality of sort of, you can see that those two fit together to form sort of a nice boundary of your, your set B. So these are the sets that, that um, are necessary. And while the set around collinear a lot of you, you introduce this blow up to manage the complexity. This set's pretty amenable. The function is very simply defined on this. It basically uh, diminishes as you move to the equator in a nice uh, behavior, well-regulated way. We understand very well the potential function on the collinear manifold. 
So we have a great deal of control over what happens here. Away from there, we've pushed all the we've pushed away all the complexity, and we have a nice smooth function that, um, while not trivial by any means, all of the regular tools of analysis become available to us. So take all those elements, each of them individually is moderately tractable. And they assemble into um, this formula for the uh, homology of the integral manifolds. Uh, low dimensions, you get some sort of interference effects, if you will, where uh, you have to manage things a little carefully. And the formula for low dimensions becomes just a little bit more complicated than for uh, uh, higher dimensions. So what is this? Does, what can we do with this? Well. I've been able to look at the first negative energy interval. So if you think of energy diminishing from positive to negative, just as you pass zero, you expect the manifold to change from positive to negative energy, you expect a bifurcation. That first interval, we, can, we know where it stops. It stops at a, at a easily calculated point. This is the first of the uh, bifurcations at infinity occurs at this energy level. And in the interval between that first negative bifurcation and zero, I can apply the formula, I can do the calculations to, and that's actually what this drawing is from. This is a schematic of what's happening to the function near collinear. And essentially that's where all the action is near zero energy. And um, uh, by contrast, you so you see the homology groups for the manifold and the reduced manifold, where again, you've quotiented by the rotational symmetry. Uh, I can compare those to the formulae that uh, Hildeberto and I produce for positive energy. And if you look at it, you see that up to dimension six, they exactly coincide. Uh, but above dimension six, a whole constellation of new homology groups appear, signaling that there's a, a significant complexity that's now appeared in the integral manifold for negative energy that wasn't present for positive energy. I can come close to replicating this result for arbitrary n. Um, the Poincare polynomial is a um, symbolic polynomial in which the coefficients are the the Betty numbers, the dimensions of the homology groups when calculated with real or rational coefficients. So if you take if you think of these polynomials as symbolic polynomials uh, in T and you read off the coefficients, they give the dimensions of the homology groups. And uh, I've been able to compute the Poincare polynomials for arbitrary n, uh, the only reason I couldn't do the, uh, the full for, for n equals four, I can do integer homology. For arbitrary n, I have to do real homology because I can't quite manage the, uh, the two torsion, the z2 coefficients. Um, if you compare the polynomials for the first negative energy range, with the Poincare polynomials for um, positive energy, you see the same phenomenon. Namely, it's easier to see here if you look at the reduced manifold, you see that same term, the one and this term, same term appears here, same term appears there, but there's a lot of new homology that appears. So as energy passes from positive to negative, the uh, homotopy type of the allowable configurations, the base doesn't change, which means essentially, if you think about the Hills region, the Hills region doesn't really change. But the fiber, the momentum fiber folds over onto itself and transitions from being a 3n minus six plane to a 3n minus six sphere. And so as I've noted, the lower dimensional homology remains unchanged, the high dimensional homology, uh, significant new structures emerge, signaling a significant change in the complexity of the manifold, in particular signaling a bifurcation occurred. And uh, one last observation, the uh, uh, full manifold 
the full integral manifold can be thought of as a circle bundle over the reduced manifold. If it were a trivial bundle, if it were essentially just had the homology of the reduced manifold cross S1, you'd see a product structure for the homology groups. If you go back and look at the homology groups, you don't see that product structure. So you can read from that that the uh, total manifold is an orientable manifold over the reduced manifold, but it's not a trivial bundle. There's some non-trivial topology, some non-trivial global twisting occurring. So uh, to summarize, um, there are significant discontinuities that add complexity to the spatial problem. And I should acknowledge when I first calculated the homology of the uh, three-body problem, um, I got it wrong uh, because of those discontinuities I didn't understand at the time. Uh, the work with Hildeberto uh, that we did 20 years ago uh, helped to, to reveal the structures that could resolve those discontinuities. Uh, using them, I can produce a reduction formula for the homology. Uh, to take that further, to actually compute the homology groups, you need to know all of the planar central configurations. Um, that is known, for example, for four equal masses, for five equal masses, six, seven equal masses, um, which brings it within the realm of the possible, but by no means means it makes it easy. Um, the, uh, you still have two very complicated functions to deal with. Um, so uh, I'm working now on uh, applying these formula to the spatial four-body problem with equal masses, the next most tractable case. Um, and as I look at that, there's some other things that I'm, I'm noting for potential future work. Uh, the functions, the interplay between the potential function u and this function y that measures the distance to the angular momentum constraint, there's some intriguing structures. If we look at each of these restricted to the mass ellipsoid, um, places where those two, uh, the gradients of those two functions are parallel are, are very interesting points. I'd like to understand them. Uh, and it, turn, it reduces really to understanding uh, the, the, the Conley-Vintner matrix, uh, which uh, sort of gives the matrix form of the potential function. Um, if the x component, y component, z component vectors turn out to be the eigenvectors of that matrix, that's essentially where those two functions become, gradients become parallel. That's where interesting uh, behavior can occur. I'd really like to understand that. Um, the, uh, the other thing I, I think is possible is, while in general, writing a closed form formula for the homology of the, uh, of the integral manifolds requires knowing uh, some details about u and y, there may be some specific values where that becomes possible even if you don't have full understanding. Again. I was able to do that for this energy region just below zero. I think at the other end of the spectrum, as energy goes all the way to minus infinity and you leave behind all of the uh, bifurcation values, the topology of the manifold has to stabilize. And I'm cautiously optimistic of being able to uh, describe that. So with that, I will close and again thank uh, Hildeberto with very warm wishes and my sincere apologies for being 20 years late in uh, getting my work uh, presented to you. Thanks for the nice talk. Uh, Thank you. Yep, uh, I'm. I'm not sure, but uh, uh, would it be interesting to to consider, uh, say, like the four body or five body problem in a uh, in a space with dimension uh, dimension four, for example? Would it be interesting to consider that? 
Um, I would expect, well, yes, uh, I, I admit I have no intuition for whether the problem gets harder or easier. Um, the, we know that, um, and I see opposite tendencies there. We see very clearly that the spatial problem is significantly more complex than the planar problem. But there's many other places uh, in this work where we see that going up into higher dimensions beyond three, um, you things, uh, if you will, untangle more easily and uh, uh, the structures become less complex. Um, I will place no bets which, which, uh, which way this goes. Hello, uh, I have comment, question. Alan? Yes. Uh, yes, th thanks a lot for, for the nice talk. Uh, if you can give me the, the slides, I, I will be happy. Um, I have a question uh, uh, about this this uh, blow up of uh, collinear. Did did you did you try to to see what it gives in the free body case where you don't need any any information because you have all the information? But maybe you can have a nice description of topology. And I, I ask this question because I, it, it it reminds me the work by. Straum and uh, Wu Xiang, Wu Xiang, the Taiwanese uh, Californian mathematician. Uh, they they studied the dynamics of the free body problem in space, and they uh, happened to have a blow up of uh, collinear states also. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's uh, the blow up is uh, adding a normal vector to the collinear uh, to the collinear uh, configuration. And so, so it's it looks like very very much like you you are do, what you are doing. So that's that's my question. Oh no, uh, I have looked at because as you say we we uh, we've analyzed the three body problem. Um, uh, my work so far has been to use that as a test case to see if uh, the results that I'm obtaining in general, when applied to the case to that case. Uh, check out and, and align. Uh, pushing that further to ask what dynamical information uh, can be teased out of that construction, uh, have not yet looked in that direction, but, but uh, thank you for that. Thank you. And I'll be happy to send you the slides. Maybe just a comment about the four dimension. Uh, we have a work with Dulin and, and there are other works at the moment. Uh, and oh, apparently there are critical points at infinity also, but there are no collisions and no collinear states, so it's good news in some way. Ah, that should make it. That should significantly simplify then. For three bodies, huh? right? Uh, any other question? Then, uh, if no question, then, uh, let's thank our speaker again. And, uh, Diego, uh, I'm ready. Yeah. Uh, uh, I write. Uh, I wrote a, a letter from Yuda Beto. Then I will project. I try to put in Portuguese in English. Let me. Mm. Como é que é o nome, Amet, do tipo da carta que eu fiz? Tem um nomezinho, né? O, ah, o tipo do poema? É. A, a, cro, a, cro, a cross, não, peraí, deixa eu procurar. A cross, a cross, a cross, a cross, a cross, a I write a letter. A cross, a cross, a cross. And I use uh, the initial from, from each line 
is a letter for the name of the event. It started by the Berto some some years ago. Then are you are you read in in, in Portuguese? É, Mestre Alberto, a admiração genuína e intensa é o que eu sinto por você. Talentosamente você construiu uma obra matemática respeitável. Extraordinária a família que você construiu. Tiago, desculpa, pode aumentar a, 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 a letra? Tá, tá um pouquinho. Né? Tá, é porque se, se aumenta muito a letra, não aparece. Ah, já sei como. Só um momento, justamente. Talvez se eu. Já sei o que eu vou fazer. É... Um, just a, a moment. Eu vou colocar primeiro em português grande e depois eu coloco em inglês. Ah, espera aí. É, uma carta para Edelberto. É, mestre Edelberto, admiração genuína e intensa que eu sinto por você. Talentosamente, você construiu uma obra matemática respeitável. Extraordinária a família que você construiu. Muitos filhos, netos, gêmeos, noras, sobrinhos, irmãos. Além disso, você plantou uma semente décadas atrás que rendeu frutos. Impetuosamente, você construiu uma grande família de matemáticos no Brasil. Resulta disso uma grande rede de matemáticas espalhada no mundo. Ademais, estamos todos aqui para celebrar a tua existência. Creio que todos estamos felizes de estar com você nesses encontros virtuais. Organizamos esse matemática corana por admiração, por respeito e por gratidão. Reconhecemos que teu trabalho abriu as portas do mundo para todos nós. Através da mecânica celeste, aprendemos um pouco sobre o mundo, o universo e tudo mais. Notoriamente, você é o fio que liga a todos nós. Aprende-se a viver observando os exemplos. Você é um extraordinário. Que venha os 100. Then, this is the, the poem in, the, in English, but I cannot, I'm not able to put the, the, name, of, the name of the initials of the event in English. I don't have English for this. Then, is this. I'm very uh, grateful for the existence of Idalberto in Brazil. He started a big family. And then in each continent, there is a friend of Idalberto who which works with celestial mechanics. Then I am very happy to make part of this group. And in a certain sense, uh, being a son of Idalberto. I, I said before Idalberto entering the, the, the meet, in Brazil, in Celestial Mechanics, uh, we are all children of Idalberto. We are a big family. And then I'm very happy. Idalberto is a, 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 a grandson, academic grandson. Then I'm very happy to be here. <laughs> then and with with Marcelo saying this is is the true. Roberto is ever ever ha happy uh, talk about mathematics. Then you happiness. Uh, I have, I have great admiration for the happiness and the energy of the person. This this. Thank you, Roberto. Thank you for for exist. Thank you very much. Tiago's avisos finais. Eita. Just uh, a moment. Um, uh, uh, soon, uh, soon, 
we will to put the links for the talks in the website and uh, in next january uh, 12 no? next 12 january we we my english is over uh, we restart the we we'll be back sorry my poor english no problem we all we all understand this. <laughs> thank you and i'm very happy for professor shane to be here today uh, i would like to see professor shane in brazil in recife and uh, all of us we will receive you in recife and uh, yeah, I, i really wish to to go uh, after the pandemic yeah <laughs> And after after the pandemic, I I maybe I can uh, visit Taiwan again. I I miss Taiwan. Sure, and sure, sure, of course. I'm very happy. <laughs> Welcome, Professor Shane. Yes. So Professor Shane is with us today. Uh, this is the wonderful technology, Google Meet and Zoom and these things. We this is a, a great moment for me. It was nice seeing you, Kuchen. Yeah, keep in touch. It looks fine. Yeah. <laughs> Visit Taiwan when you have time. Yeah, yes. Well, sure. When if if any, Bra if any Brazilian visit Taiwan, then he, he can't <laughs> stop in Paris. In the middle. He can't stop uh, everywhere. Yeah. Paris is in the middle. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's a great day I stop in Paris. <laughs> yeah. It's a great idea. Great. Okay, guys, everybody have a, a good uh, holidays. No? Merry Christmas. Enjoy your Noel. No, uh, I don't know if we uh, Taiwanese, <laughs> uh, but uh, have Merry Christmas and Happy New Year to everybody. The and, picture. Uh, I'm the picture. Yeah, I hope we can get together. Yes, uh, maybe Marcel, could you could you stop to record and we can take the picture? So Tiago, could you stop your presentation also, please? Sure, sure. Thank.